Well, hello and welcome to a special edition of one of our one of Blue Strings webinars, uh, specially recorded for Richard Sounds. My name is Daniel. I'm part of the Blue String technical team here in Europe. You've probably already heard from my colleague Aidan uh, and possibly my colleague Chris, who've also been recording uh, some of our webinar sessions, especially for uh, for you. In this webinar session, we're going to take you through some of the scenarios that come up when video gaming meets video distribution. Okay, we're going to look at some ways to incorporate product, uh, the issues that you're commonly going to come up against, and, and some of our products that can help. It's, it's a very, very hot topic at the moment. You've got a couple of new 4K games consoles on the market, chiefly the PlayStation 5, the Xbox Series X. Uh, but one, you know, it's, it's one we're plagued with daily at the moment is the questions around these kind of like these devices. So something that we thought we'd, uh, we'd bring to you uh, and give you some information on. So hopefully what, uh, you'd, what we'd like you to take away from today's session, what we hope you'll take away from today's session is some of the things, well, some of the things we've got up here on screen, some of the things we're going to be covering. Just want to give you an overview just before we step into, into too much detail. And if you take away two or three things from today, then we've, we've done our job. We've won. So that's, that's what we're aiming for. But we're going to take a look at retro gaming. We're going to take a look at wireless controllers, things like USB extension of controllers. And then we're going to have a look at the new generation of consoles, the next generation, and what, what that means for us. So HDMI 2.1, some of the HDMI cables, and some of the system setups and layouts, that, or, or the, the best one we think that there is for this. So let's get going. Let's have a look and dive in first. We are going to get nostalgic. Okay, so we see a lot of customers now with the collection of retro consoles. And, and this is a subject I could go on for a long time about, okay? It's um, something that's dear to my heart, I guess. Uh, it, I'm going to guess that some of the people who are watching this webinar probably never went around for the GameCube. That's that's touching nearly 20 years old now, uh, and that makes me feel incredibly old. But, you know, things like the the original Xbox, are they old? You know, where do, where do some of the people begin uh, on end when it comes to the retro hardware? But th the point is... People are collecting these older systems and they're using them more and more. And none of these things have a HDMI socket on them natively. Okay. And not without some serious DIY, you know, from a specialist, from a, and, and a great cost. You're not going to get a HDMI port added to one of these devices. You're going to get things, the native ports on these things are things like composite. Uh, you might get some S video, but they're, they're SCART connections. You might find the odd VGA or even a component cable for some of the, more recent retro consoles if there is such a thing uh, like the the xbox 360 uh, or perhaps the uh, yeah you'll, you'll get one out for uh, for an original xbox they can be found you've got ones for gamecube so there are there are the odd the odd chance of finding one out there but not a hdmi socket itself so what we do is we we have a couple of devices uh, from our multi-format presentation range uh, the MFP72 and the MFP1, uh, MFP112 chiefly from within that range. And as a side effect uh, of these two great products being built and designed for the commercial world, they're actually great for bits of retro gaming. Okay, They weren't built with retro gaming in mind, but they're perfect for some legacy sources being converted to HDMI for output to a, a TV or, or some video distribution. The MFP72, slightly smaller than the 112, but you've got things like VGA inputs, we've got component inputs, we've got composite inputs, so we can we can throw anything we like in there from, from days of old. So we're talking about things like taking an N64 with its composite video output and its analog audio, or an Xbox 360 and its component output uh, and analog audio, and bringing them into a single unit, say an MFP72, like in the diagram on screen you've got there now, and having them upscaled to uh, HD resolution, and then brought out on a HDMI connector, and then you can connect that straight to even the, you know, the latest Sony OLED panel and get your N64, Xbox 360, those legacy devices with those kind of types of, uh, of outputs connected straight to a HDTV. And it, it's just a really neat way of bringing legacy devices together uh, with some HDMI devices, if you like. You've got four HDMI inputs on there as well on a 72. And just bringing them all in, in one neat switcher and getting them out to, uh, to a TV. The other thing worth mentioning that we see a little bit of as well uh, is the is a den say with an MX44 VW in, and this just means that you can get a, bit, a little bit of picture in picture going on, or you can get multiple source devices up on the same screen. We've got a lot of places now where you've got a large format display, you know, upwards of 85 inches or projectors, 
and they got they can show one thing on screen at once and actually you might want to be able to show two or three or four in this case there's got those four hdmi inputs and there's some some cool fixed layouts but it means that you can say maybe do a bit of gaming in the background or having your skybox ticking over with the news in the top corner if there's something going on and if it's not going to interfere obviously with what you're doing on the main the main image but it just means yeah you can get some nice things like skyboxes um say xboxes with hdmi outputs going into it there's some vj inputs there but there's less legacy connectivity here and it means you might have to convert things to hdmi first uh, but it does mean you can do some pretty cool stuff uh, and have some pretty cool features going so just some notes to round out on retro console gaming then the older consoles have wired controllers in general so they're only ever going to be local in a room where they're set up okay with some sort of video conversion to hdmi for your newer television sets or to go on into distribution hardware wireless controllers you can get them for retro consoles but they're going to suffer the same as a modern wireless controller which is something we're going to cover in a few slides time i mean controller extension needs exist for some of this retro stuff but you're not going to wire that through walls walls in your house okay so the, the retro gaming console stuff is generally local in the room where you can plug your controller in and, and play without having to worry about uh, without having to worry about wireless and that kind of thing because it just doesn't exist for them there's only uh, the only other note i'll make is that just perform one type of conversion at once to get to hdmi okay just don't don't convert say composite to component and then to hdmi keep it straight as a once one conversion from whatever the native of the console or the device is straight to hdmi if you think about it if you translate english to french then french to german and then you take that german and translate it back into english you are not going to get the english sentences that you started uh, with at the beginning of that uh, that translation and it's exactly the same with video. You're just asking for trouble if you trans if you convert and translate that video signal into different things at different times. Cool. Let's move on to something a bit more up to date. Wireless controllers. Where a games console has a wireless controller, we, we definitely meet a new challenge uh, when it comes to using a, a console in video distribution. Wireless technologies vary, but you've got RF and Bluetooth. Those are the primary ones in use. The Xbox controllers, as we understand it, they use an RF connection. Uh, maybe some of the, the later stuff is, is now on Bluetooth because you can connect it to an iPad and things like that. Uh, certainly the Xbox 360 stuff was RF. But then you've got the PlayStation and the Nintendo Joy-Cons definitely running on a, on a Bluetooth connection. First thing is really, what can we do to help the distance that you can get those wireless controllers to work over? So we're, we're sort of thinking of what we're talking about here is where you've got a games console and if you want to hide it away in a cupboard, either in room or with a distribution system with a matrix, how far away can you get away from it with the controller and it still work and what can you do to kind of help and improve that? The well, We've got a picture there on screen of somebody who's put a metal cage around their wireless router to stop transmission of, of uh, harmful wireless. It seems to be a thing on eBay at the moment. You can buy these cages. But that picture is there to demonstrate the fact that if you if you stick a cons games console inside a metal rack in a cupboard or in a piece of furniture, you're actually creating a, a slightly, almost slightly creating a, a Faraday cage where it will stop or it will hurt the wireless transmission for the for the controllers because it's inside this metal box. So if you can get the console outside of the rack, you're probably going to get a better distance for the wireless controller uh, in the installation in the first place. In terms of solid objects and barriers for the wireless communication to your controller, the worst thing actually bizarrely is paper. So books, all this kind of stuff. Um, it can be worse than brick paper uh, because of density and all that kind of thing. So if you can keep um, large sort of walls of books, paper and things away from your in from your transmission between your console and your wireless controller, then it should go a much better, a greater distance. Obviously, solid objects, yeah, walls, yeah, all that kind of stuff. That's that's a no brainer. But the point is here, really, you, you've got to get that console, hopefully, into the space where you want to use it with a wireless controller these days on the modern consoles. You've got things like foil backed insulation between floors. Uh, so if you have a uh, Celotex, uh, I want to say in Kingspan, used in modern homes a lot and in lots of um, up in the high-end new builds, 
or high-end retrofit it's it's something that we now as a very effective insulation choose to put in and it's an absolute killer and it's why you normally end up with a wi-fi access point on each floor of a building that's got foil backed insulation between its floors um because it just it just absolutely kills that transmission so it's absolutely open air if you can that's the utter ideal to have that games console placed in the room where it can be seen almost with a line of sight is obviously going to be your best result. But we understand that that's not always achievable. So sometimes just cupboard doors, obviously fine. It's just about thinking about what's what's that wireless communication having to go through before it gets between console and uh, and controller and what you can do to improve that a bit and therefore get that, that controller to work at a greater distance. If you want to stick to having a hardwired USB controller, say, the likes of which Xbox and PlayStation series offer, then things can be extended quite some distance. So say we, we definitely want to put that console in the cupboard, we definitely want to have, uh, or we want to have it in the, in the rack, in the basement, in the video distribution. So we're going to run a hardwired USB controller. Uh, we're going to not worry about the wireless because we can't make it happen. Then it can be done. You can extend USB over category cabling and go quite some distances. Obviously, what it means is for your customers is that they're going to have a hardwired controller in the room that they're going to use and not the Wi-Fi, uh, not the wireless controller, rather, they, they would uh, probably be used to. So it's an interesting conversation to have with customer first so that they, they understand that they might not be able to use their wireless controller. So you can pick up things like uh, the M Solutions provide a range of extenders that look like the thing on screen you've got there that will do HD base D with USB, for example. Uh, and you, you can definitely pick up extension of USB over CAT6 that's purely just for USB. And watch this space for Bluestream hardware coming later in the year where we're going to have a selection of stuff that will carry USB over a piece of category cable. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of notes we can add here. Like It's worth noting that the PlayStation 4, the first, the, v, the V1 DualShock controllers don't do their USB, uh, don't send, can't send control commands over USB. You need a V2 for that, okay? And the way that um, Sony use USB between a V2 DualShock controller on a PlayStation 4 and the console, it, it doesn't transfer over video over IP because they do it in a proprietary manner, it doesn't work. So whilst our multicast system has USB, uh, on it, you can't use that to extend a PlayStation 4 controller, but you can use it to extend an Xbox controller. Just to be totally completist about all of this, if you're going to come up against anything and everything in the out there in the in the, in the installation world, the other things that are going to stop you from hiding your console away in uh, either in a cupboard very far away or in a rack are things like the accessories that you've got to connect or that people want to connect. The PlayStation 4 VR is a perfect example of that. It's hardwired by a pair of cables that have unique connectors on them and that they can't be extended when you're using the latest version of the PS4 VR headset. Uh, so they've got a, you've got a, a PS4 VR box that sits between your console and television. Uh, in terms of cabling, you come out of the PlayStation into the VR box, then from the VR box to the TV. Whilst you can extend the distance that that is away from the television, uh, sorry, I think you can extend it well. Yeah, the distance that that is away from the TV and is away from the, the console, you can't extend the headset. So it's got to be in room and it's got to be nearby. What's more limiting is the camera that they use for the, the VR. The PlayStation 4 VR camera can have a, an you can buy an extension cable for it, but again, it's a proprietary shaped connector and the maximum distance that it works at is 12 feet. So you, you can't you can't go any further than that. So that's seriously limiting about the distance away you can place that console from that camera. So 12 feet of cabling, that is, that's it. I mean, the Wii wireless sensor bar, these things are dying out, but the Wii and the Wii U use a, a wireless sensor bar. These things are easier to extend. You can buy cabling that goes quite away, but you're not going to bury that across a wall. So again, something like a, a Wii or a Wii U is going to be something that remains quite local to the space uh, and quite nearby your equipment. Uh, so I guess after all of that, we've talked about wireless controllers, we've talked about accessories, all of these limiting factors to why you might want to keep your games console local in the room rather than plug it into a distribution. If you really then want to go ahead and bury it in, in a rack, in a basement or in a loft, wherever it might be, and you're going to run a hardwired USB controller, for example, uh, the other thing you've got to make, you've got to be aware of is latency. Okay, Latency is important to gamers. It can be the difference between a happy gamer and a sad gamer. 
Okay, and then there's latency to consider inside the distribution technology that you use. HT base T class of zero distribute a zero latency, so you're absolutely fine to use that with gaming uh, in pretty much all circumstances. Video over IP systems, though, they vary. We can have from a single frame of latency to many frames. And most of the time, it's just not advisable to use a video over IP system to distribute a video, a gaming console or a, a gaming PC for that reason. Okay, so bear that in mind if people are thinking about sticking their PlayStation 4 or PlayStation 5 in a distribution because they want to keep it out of the way. But they, you, you've got to worry about latency potentially on a, on a video over IP system. It just might not cut it. Getting your television to go into game mode so it stops doing all of that processing. I mean, I remember Samsung panels that would add two seconds uh, doing all of their motion smoothing. And you could get rid of all of that latency within the TV itself. Uh, by turning it off in, into game mode. And that might improve things to a point where the customer's happy. But just bear in mind that latency needs to be as low as possible. There can be some in the distribution and there can be some in the television set. Brilliant. Okay, so now we've covered the retro consoles and some of the issues that surround, I guess, the previous generations of console hardware. We can look at the next generation and the specific challenges that these pose. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. There's there's a bit more on the slides, but I think we can just get to we can just keep to the key points, uh, and hopefully you can take away a few bits and bobs to point you in the right direction as to what to do with these consoles when customers want to use them in their home cinema setups or inside their video distribution. The key thing really is that these are a HDMI 2.1 device. Okay, they're the first real source device out there on the market that has HDMI 2.1 capable outputs. They might end up being the only ones, but the, the HDMI 2.1 content is there. That's the actual gameplay itself. Now, we run a separate webinar on the features of HDMI 2.1. That might be something you want to take a look at uh, outside of the, the Richer Sound series of Bluestream webinars and dive into the, the normal series of Bluestream stuff. But you, some of these things you might recognize from the specifications of the televisions that you're dealing with in store now. Uh, yeah, I guess we're jumping up in bandwidth. That's the key thing. We're moving into 4K at 120 frames and possibly 8K. Uh, and some of those other features are listed there on screen that these consoles actually support and you're going to need inside the TV to take advantage of them. But what are the problems with that? Okay, there's no 48 gigabits per second. So no HDMI 2.1 distribution hardware yet. There's no switches or splitters, no matrices. So that means that your customer, if they plug their brand new shiny games console into a, uh, an existing uh, video distribution system, say the maximum you're going to get is an 18 gigabits per second signal, and you're not going to be getting the full uh, capability of that console out across the video distribution. It's going to have to be cut back. There's a minimal selection of AVRs out there with HDMI 2.1, and some of them have issues, and we'll talk about that just briefly in a sec. 4K now is an interesting conversation with your customer because 4K 60 hertz at 18 gig is now split with 4K 120 hertz in HDMI 2.1. So you've got two different formats of 4K now again, if you like. We had 10 gig 4K before and, and then 18 gig was added. Now we've got HDMI 2.1 4K and trying to explain to a customer that these things are all different and this is what you can support and this is what you can't is going to be, is going to be a tricky thing. EARC not something I outlined, that's enhanced audio return channel. So this is the ability for full Dolby uh, Dolby Atmos True HD format audio, say, for example, to be carried from a TV back down a HDMI cable to an AVR. And that can only be done on a direct HDMI cable at the moment. It cannot be done over a piece of video distribution hardware. So if your customer has their PlayStation 5 or their Xbox directly plugged into their television, and the AVR is connected to the TV on a set of HD base T extenders, they're not going to get the eARC feature to go back to the AVR. So again, it's a limiting factor on what the console is capable of doing. The last note there is we have we've dynamic HDR, not to delve too much deep, too deeply into that because we have again another webinar that talks about this. But if you have something like Dolby Vision in original mode and it's coming from an Xbox Series X, uh, and you try and pass that over video over IP or HD base T with CSC, any form of compression or conversion on the signal then the done out the Dolby Vision data is lost so again you're limiting the the capability of the output from the console because you're not going to be able to use that feature the known issues that we sort of briefly mentioned on there to do with uh, AVRs 
it's essentially you've got Marantz, you've got Denon, and you've got Yamaha who all use a particular piece of electronics in their hardware, and it has known problems with HDMI 2.1, and it has known problems with Xbox Series Xs, PlayStation 5s, and some NVIDIA graphics cards. These were the first sort of AVRs to be available on the market, and they have early adopter syndrome, I guess. They have some problems. And I'm going to guess you guys are going to be aware of some of this because it's the kind of hardware that you deal in. But Sound United, have uh, there have been various press releases about it. Uh, it's a well-known, well-understood thing. They're not sure whether it's a hardware or a software fix to correct the problem. And we also know that some of the Denon and Marantz hardware has issues, specific issues with SkyQ boxes, something that we're aware Sky are working to fix with firmware in their devices. Uh, it's not a firmware issue in the Denon devices. It's more, it's on the Sky side. So they can be problematic. We're finding 2019 model Denons are working perfectly. 2020 models don't. Even if you're just trying to pass 1080p or football 4K 18 gigs, they are a problem. The other thing worth mentioning here is that we listed some of those specs, those features that HDMI 2.1 has. And between years and between manufacturers, they are varying the things from the HDMI 2.1 specification that a TV supports. So Samsung and LG in particular, they keep changing what they include inside the TV from the HDMI 2.1 specification. So it, it doesn't just vary between manufacturers, it can be LG's 2019 sets have different features to LG's 2020 sets. So you might not get the feature that you wanted or for your games console because it's it's been removed for some reason. It's a really strange situation. So just really drill down into what the specifications of the TV do to make sure that it supports the, thing, the things you're going to need really ideally for gaming like ALM and VRR if you just want to have a look and see what those, those terms mean. So again, just be careful. Um, with which set that someone's trying to use because they then might not get the most out of that games console or they might be missing that feature. So all of that said, what are some of the fixes? Okay, uh, with HDMI 2.1, we there's some of the issues, are, well, the biggest, I guess one of the biggest issues is cable distance. So a HDMI 2.1 cable, if you want to call it that, an ultra high speed HDMI cable, can only be one to two meters long maximum as a passive cable. And that's a problem if you want to get that games console three, four, five meters away. Uh, and again, if you want to keep it in a rack and you want to send it over a long 10, 15 meter cable to a display, you can't do that on a standard passive copper cable. We've now released our Bluestream Precision 48 cables, 48 gig cables. They are there. They are available in three lengths. They support enhanced audio return channels. So they're perfect to go between a HDMI 2.1 AVR and a HDMI 2.1 TV and have the games console either plugged into the television, providing audio backwards, or have it plugged into the AVR and providing picture and audio forwards. They are certified now by the HDMI organization. So they are absolutely ready to go, 100% compatible. Uh, and they solve that problem of how you can get uh, longer distances of, of 48 gig HDMI 2.1 cabling. So we, we talked about, uh, we mentioned a lack of HDMI 2.1 hardware out there. Uh, we do have some in development. Okay, so we, we're going we're gonna to fix this slowly, I guess, as, as things go along. We have got an 8K 2x4 splitter on the way. We've got a an 8K 4x1 switch that actually says splitter there, it shouldn't. Uh, and we've got the 8K eARC adapter coming, which is an, a nifty little device to do audio separation for things like sound bars and AVRs, whilst keeping things directly connected to TVs, kind of there for older, potentially older hardware. Uh, all of them are 40 or 48 gigs of HDMI 2.1 bandwidth, support 8K, support HDCP 2.3, all this stuff going on. But they are in flux at the moment. So you guys are on the ground. You're talking to people daily who want to use these things with their consoles, use these things with their their existing installations. If you have feedback about what you think it would be good to have included on these or what might actually make these better, then let us know because we can get that looked at and changed now and you can have an effect on these products and have something better suited for your scenarios and your situations. Okay, back to the whole point of everything then, I guess we'll round everything off nicely. Now that you've got some background, what are you going to do if your client asks you to integrate a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox Series X into a, into a video distribution system? The key here really is to make sure that the conversation about this happens as early as possible. Okay, you've got to address the issue before the client doesn't get the desired outcome. Because perhaps learning 
that their console has got to go local in a room after the fact, after all of this has been decided, they might not have wanted that. It's crucial to understand what the console is being used for. Is it being used for gaming at all? Sounds daft, but some people put these things in and use them as a media server or a 4K Blu-ray player. It's a massively expensive thing to do to do use of that, but that's what they do. So you might not have to worry about wireless controllers at all anyway. And that usage, you know, they're, what they're going to use it for could just point you to whether it can go in a rack in a distribution or whether it needs to go local. It's, it's kind of worth noting at that point with that, that the PlayStation 5 has a Bluetooth remote. It has no method of IR control. Okay, so if you put this thing in a rack, you've got no way of controlling it other than from its Bluetooth remote or its DualShock controller. So getting it away at distance is going to be very difficult. You, you used to get, and you guys will have probably seen them, IR to Bluetooth converters for things like your PlayStation 3. And then we had CEC control of a PlayStation 4. And so you might be able to get control a different way. Some of the Bluestream HCs include uh, CEC control of sources, and therefore that might mean they can control their PlayStation 5 that way. The Xbox does have IR control, and that's carried over from the old Xbox One and uses the same codes and everything. So it's, it's dead easy to use it with an IR repeater if you've got an IR remote for the for it. It's going to be worth discussing any infrastructure changes with your client that might need to happen, like changing of to 48 gig HDMI cabling to HDMI 2.1 capable cables. That might mean the walls are coming out. It might not. But what does a client want to achieve? Do they? What do you want to achieve? Is it is it enhanced audio return channel set up for Atmos? Or do they just have a Dolby 5.1 set up for surround sound that means that all standard audio return channel is absolutely fine? It, it, all of those things, probably explained in layman's terms, are essential to understand. You know, they might not need an AVR upgrade to get to where they want to be in a Dolby digital cinema, for example. If the console is connected directly to a HDMI 2.1 TV and they just want to use ARC to go back to the AVR, they might not need to change the AVR to a HDMI 2.1 AVR. Um, and the other thing is, is are they are they going to upgrade the TV, for example, to take advantage of this new console? They've got this PlayStation 5, they've got this Xbox, but we don't have a HDMI 2.1 TV. Well, there's there's a sales opportunity, but they're not going to get the most out of it without the hardware. There are, and yeah, rounding out, I mean, there are pros and cons to introducing the console to distribution, and it's good to go over those, you know, to go over the wireless controller distance, to go over the having to use a USB controller. The, but the desire for them to use their new expensive purchase, if you like, in more than one room of their house via a video distribution that's probably more and more, even, even more expensive and part of their smart home system, it might have been something you've sold them to, to do that. You sold them a video distribution to do SkyQ to eight rooms of their home. They want to use that because they paid a lot of money for it with their Xbox. And what you're actually saying is that they can't. And that feeling could be quite strong to begin with. And it's just getting them to understand why uh, they might need to change their mind about where it goes in order to get the best use out of it. So just to give you a little example about um, how we sort of see these things being set up in, in the most is HDMI 2.1 cable between PlayStation or Xbox and the television local in the room. Considering everything, wireless controllers, 4K 120 hertz or 8K resolutions, enhanced audio return channel, VRR, you know, your Dolby Vision, all that stuff, console direct TV, and then using a HDMI uh, 2.0 cable or a HDMI 2.1 cable that specifically lists itself as capable of eARC back to the AVR, and then the AVR obviously has got Dolby Atmos that can then send back to speakers in the room. Okay, this is where it's going to be most commonly. There are AVRs out there that do uh, that do eARC that aren't HDMI 2.1, and they don't need to be if the console is directly connected to the TV. But what we're getting at here is that the console is going to be local, ideally for wireless controller. For it's going to be on a HDMI 2.1 display to get the most out of it. And it's going to be on a HDMI 2.1 capable, uh, say, optical, active optical cable from Bluestream with eARC back to an AVR that's capable of HDMI 2.1 or eARC at least. So definitely going to be the best way forward. So you, you guys are very privileged to have a, a dedicated custom install team that have this kind of knowledge to design and execute this type of product into a system. Uh, and I think your custom install team are, are the experts at the advanced technologies that uh, that we deploy and to bring a seamless entertainment experience to your customers. So where you're faced with a customer requiring any type of distribution that you just don't feel comfortable with or don't feel comfortable explaining, then get in touch with them because they are, they are there to help you out. 
Likewise, we are uh, an extended arm to the Richer Sounds experience uh, by providing dedicated support to the Rich team wherever, you know, whenever they need it. So you can view, you can view the entire product portfolio on the website. You can reach out to us directly. Uh, you can give us a ring, drop us an email. There's live chat on the website. Just get in touch with us if you need any kind of help at all or any kind of explanation is absolutely what we're here for. So yeah, make sure that you get in touch. Don't stew over anything. Don't try and figure it out. I know that we all we don't take directions. We don't read manuals, but we don't waste two hours trying to figure something out that a quick five minute phone call could fix. You know, get in touch with us. Drop us an email, and we'll we'll help you out. I guess all that remains for me to say is thank you very much. Hopefully you feel a little bit more comfortable talking to your customers about the introduction of, of a games console into their home system. Uh, and thank you very much for listening and we'll see you around for the next one. Cheers. <laughs>